Hello and welcome to this uh, next session on uh, spectroscopy, where we are going to be talking about UV vis uh, adsorption spectroscopy. And then a little bit later on, we'll be talking about atomic spectroscopy, which um, in atomic absorption spectroscopy uses much of the same uh, theory. So uh, let's get started. So what is absorption spectroscopy or in this sense, molecular absorption spectroscopy? Well, molecular absorption spectroscopy results from the absorbance A or transmittance T of a solution in a transparent cell having a path length of B. So we're putting in our spectrometer some sort of cuvette, which we learned about before, usually a cuvette filled with a solution uh, containing a solvent and also our solute of interest, our analyte. And then we are measuring the absorbance or transmittance from that sample. Uh, and then the path length is the length or the width of the cell, which is in the beam of light. And so where do we use this kind of uh, molecular absorption spectroscopy in a great many different forms of spectroscopy? We use it in UV vis spectroscopy, IR, Raman, HPLC detectors, to name but a few. And typically uh, we have a uh, concentration absorbance relationship, which is linear. Uh, it's related by the Beer-Lambert or Beer's law, which is given here. So absorbance is uh, equal to minus log to the base 10 of the transmittance uh, given as a fraction. Um, and that's equal then to log of the um, P0 over P, where P0 is the incident beam and P is the emitted beam. And that then is eventually equal to this term here, which is the most common form that we use, which is epsilon BC, where epsilon is a molar extinction coefficient typically in its use uh, in most analytical cases. This is going to be our kind of uh, mo molecules or system specific value um, then B is the path length, so that's the distance or the width of the cell um, that the light passes through, and then C is the concentration of the species within, and so you can see then from that equation, the concentration plays a large role in determining the absorbance of a particular compound. Now, why might this not be true? In practice, there are some attributes of a solution which may cause it to have a different absorbance than normal. So a measurement of absorbance and transmittance. So here are some of the potential losses of light. So we have a cuvette here, we have it filled with our solution. We have our incident beam and we have our emergent beam. So one of the major losses is in reflection where the light is just reflected off of the surface of the cuvette because the cuvette is typically made of glass which is a semi-reflective surface and this results in loss of light intensity. And then another loss potentially is through scattering losses. So this is where the beam of light is scattered by the particles inside. And so that has a greater or lesser effect depending on the size of the particles and the wavelength of the light that we are using. So in an ideal world, the beam is only attenuated or reduced by the sample but practically the beam is also attenuated or reduced by reflection at the interface, so the interface here and the interface here. So the two walls that the light passes through, both of them can result in reflection, um, or we can have scattering in solution by the different particles, whether those be the analyte particles, whether those be uh, the solvent particles or other components of the solution. To overcome this problem, the solution with and without the analyte are compared. So the absorbance is equal to log of the P of the solvent over P of the solution. And that is effectively approximately equal to log of P zero over P. So this is the power that passes through the solvent, the power that passes through the solution. And then transmittance is equal to a similar concept. So Beer's law um, also um, is not species specific. So if there are more than one absorbing species at the same wavelength, they um, will contribute to the absorbance that we measure in our spectrometer. So it is a um, sum of all, so the total absorbance is a sum of all of the species which absorb at that wavelength. Uh, sometimes, hopefully we've designed our system so that there's only one absorbing species at that point. But it's not always possible to do that, especially in uh, environmental or biological systems. And so then, um, since the total absorbance is equal to the individual absorbances, 
then we can translate those into Beer Lambert law um, expressions. So the total absorbance is equal to um, the epsilon of species one times the path length times the concentration of species one plus the epsilon of species two times the path length, which would be the same for all species because they're all in the same sample holder times the concentration of species two and so on. So here are some definitions that we might find useful. So incident radi radiant power is given the letter P0, and this is the radiant power in watts incident on the sample. Trans and so it also has uh, incident intensity as an alternative name. Um, transmitted radiant uh, power P is radiant power transmitted by the sample, and transmitted intensity is its alternative name. Absorbance, we already know. Transmittance, we already know. And um, path length of the sample B, we already know the concentration of the absorber is C, absorptivity is A, and molar absorptivity is epsilon. So this is the one we use most often. And so usually the uh, concentration is expressed in moles per liter, um, and B is in centimeters, and epsilon is um, given the letter uh, or sorry, molar absorptivity is given the letter epsilon. And so this is going to be um, species specific. Um, so the Beer Lambert law is not perfect. Um, but there are some concerns with it. Um, it's usually used to create a calibration curve so that we can find the concentrations of any unknown species. But the problem therein is that. Sometimes there are deviations from this linear behavior. So for example, here we have um, an absorbance versus concentration graph, and we have the ideal behavior here, which would be perfectly linear, but we can have deviations, either positive or negative deviations, which come about due to um, system components, maybe um, fundamental problems, chemical problems, or instrumental problems. So fundamental problems are things like um, concentration being too high. Concentration is too high, then what we have is sometimes the analyte particles will interact with each other. And if they interact with each other, sometimes that changes their absorbance. Chemical can be a reaction could take place and instrumental could be things like stray light entering the uh, spectrometer, which is why we always must be careful to close our spectrometer properly before we begin our measurements. So Beer's law is a limiting law. It is only accurate at low analyte solute concentrations. So high concentrations, i.e. those above 0.01 molar, cause an increase in solute-solute interactions. And this affects charge distribution. As we'll see later, the, the major component here of what's happening is that we have a, a molecule in a, a low energy state, a ground state, and it will then be excited by the absorption of that light that we're giving it um, to a higher energy state, which we will term the excited state. Then um, if, however, there are many analyte molecules or solute molecules around, they can interact with each other and that can change those energy levels and thus change the um, wavelength at which the different uh, particles absorb. So this alters the solute ability to absorb at a given wavelength. And this then changes the epsilon value, the molar extinction coefficient. If an analyte associates, dissociates, or reacts to produce a product with a different absorption spectrum, we also will get deviations from our Beer's law. Because remember, when we measure the Beer's law, we are measuring the absorbance at only one wavelength. So the example here is a weak acid base dissociation. So depending on how much of it is dissociated, we may in fact get different absorption spectrums. So if both HA and A minus absorb at the same wavelength, Beer's law then becomes this, where we have the absorbance at a given wavelength is going to be equal to the sum of the two individual components. So epsilon of HA, which is probably different from epsilon of A minus, and path length of B is the same in both, and then the concentration of the two species is different, which should add up to the total concentration. Uh, so this is a very simple looking, um, spectrometer for UV vis absorption spectroscopy. There are other types, but we'll only talk about this one today. So we have, of course, our light source, which is um, on the left-hand side. So we talked about this before in the general design of optical instruments. 
we have a light source here which produces the light um, of an energy HV. Um, so this then passes through a filter or monochromator to create a single wavelength of light, which we will then shine onto our sample and use that for the absorption. We have a shutter here, which can um, turn on and off the light onto the sample. Then we have a reference cell and a sample cell. So usually these are in sort of like a, a, a lever, which can be pushed in or out, which can manipulate the position, which allows a particular cell to be in the path or not in the path. So that allows us to measure the two samples without really needing um, to manipulate too much. Um, so the reference cell would be exactly the same as the sample cell, only without the analyte in theory. Then we have P0, which comes out. Um, and then we have a photo detector, which um, is our transducer. It takes our, a, a light signal and turns it into an electrical signal. Then that electrical signal is amplified by the circuit, and then we get some sort of readout. So the general flow is we have a light source which feeds into a filter or a monochromator, which um, is going to separate out the different wavelengths of light or block some of them so that we excite our sample only with particular wavelengths so that whenever we're measuring the absorbance, we are measuring the absorbance at one wavelength only. Then of course we have our sample and then we have our detector, which is what is going to turn the light into an electrical signal. And then we have our readout. So this is the simplest of designs. It's pretty cost-effective. Um, it's not a very high throughput instrument and there are some issues with regards to um, the lever causing the sample to move about too much or something like that. But it's really quite um, reasonable, um, reasonably priced. Sometimes there's no lever and sometimes you have to manually remove the cells and place them back in again. But ultimately, um, it just depends on your individual situation. It's really quite okay to have this kind of spectrometer. Uh, so the simplest of designs uh, from US dollars, 1,000 to about 8,000, just depending on how fancy the monochromator is, how reliable it is, and uh, how much light it can shut out. Um, so really, quite cost effective as far as chemical instruments go. So only one sample holder may be present where both sample and reference can be alternatively interposed. So basically swap one out for the other. So as I mentioned earlier, whenever we're doing this, uh, we're having the molecule absorb some light. So we have incident radiation, uh, which is termed P0 and it's incident on our sample. And then we have transmitted radiation, which should hopefully be lower in intensity. Now, what is happening here? We have an absorbance of the light by the sample. So the sample is going from a ground state or a lower excited state, which you call the ground state. So here it has low energy. It's just in its normal resting position, um, which, which we term as the ground state or the zero energy level. Then upon absorbance of the correct wavelengths of light, we see that there is an excitation from this ground state to an excited state, whether that be the first excited state, second, third, fourth, and so on. Just depends. Now, these gaps have a certain distance, and that distance is a certain energy, and that energy can be related by a Planck's relationship to the frequency or the wavelength of the light, which means that our molecules are likely only to absorb certain wavelengths of light. Then, um, and that wavelength of light corresponds to the changes, either zero to one or zero to two or zero to three or zero to four um, and so on. Just depends on how much energy is being transmitted to the sample. And then this uh, is what is happening in a schematic form. And then from our spectra, we can see this. So this energy that we're, we have here is made up of electronic, vibrational and rotational parts. The electronic is the largest component, so that meaning it's the one that has the most energy. The vibrational and rotational, we won't talk about too much in this class, but in future classes, you will come across this, um, where we will talk about IR and Raman spectroscopy. But um, for UV vis, we just have electronic transitions. Um, so these are the major components there, ones present in UV vis, but these ones can also affect the electronic energy. But these, uh, i.e. Um, the vibrational rotational energies, can affect the electronic energy since molecules can have varying rotational and vibrational energies, which results in the broadbands in the UV spectrum. So ideally, if we just have electronic transitions, we would have a, a sharp spectrum like this with sharp peaks. 
But unfortunately, due to the reality of the situation, we have a lot of different things going on in solution. Molecules are vibrating, they are rotating. And so what happens is that we get a broadband observed. So the difference in energy between molecular bonding, non-bonding, and anti-bonding orbitals ranges from 125 to 650 kilojoules per mole. So it can be quite energetic. And this energy corresponds to electromagnetic radiation in the ultraviolet region which is 100 to 350 nanometers and visible regions, which is 350 to 700 nanometers of the spectrum. So this energy, which is required to do this is usually in the UV vis region of the spectrum. So what's happening here is that the molecule M is absorbing some light, which we su supply, it to, uh, supply to it. And then that forms an excited state then this excited state obviously eventually dissipates that energy out as it relaxes back down. Sometimes it's as light as well. Sometimes it's just as heat. And sometimes a photochemical reaction happens like a degradation reaction. This is one of the reasons why, um, you know, if you put like a, a signboard out in direct sunlight, and um, maybe not immediately, but maybe over the course of several years, it starts to fade. And this fading is due to the reaction of the molecules, the dye molecules with the sunlight and they are becoming degraded over time. Um, they're, they're gaining energy from the sun, then they're relaxing, and the energy they're giving out is via a photochemical reaction, which is a degradation reaction, which is the destruction of the dye molecules. So here we have, um, again, a schematic which shows the energy transitions from a ground state up to one or two different uh, excited states. So uh, we talked about the idea that this energy could be emitted as light. So sometimes it is. And so if it were perfect um, elastic relaxation, we would get exactly the same amount of energy out as we put in. And so we would have uh, terms for each one of these transitions as so. So for example, we have the transition from uh, the first excited state down to the ground state given by this equation, from the second down to the ground given by this equation, and from the second to the first, which is also possible given as this. And of course, we can have different effects, solvent effects of the system. So if we measure this molecule in different uh, systems and different environments, then we will see different spectra. So the vapor spectrum, you can see it's full of sharp lines, which are actually quite readable and can be uh, assigned to the different um, orbitals within the molecule. Then the, in hexane solution, we see that there are more solvent solute interactions. Well, there is no solvent at the vapor phase, so there are no solvent solute interactions. But if we put it in a non-polar solvent like hexane, then we see that there are um, going to be some uh, broadening of peaks um, because of the additional interactions between the solvent and the solute. And then in aqueous solution, we have here um, a broad continuum as there are great many interactions caused by the um, polar solvent interacting with this molecule. So uh, in UV phase, which samples can be detected? So absorbing species can usually be organic compounds. Um, they are typically um, have absorbances above 185 nanometers for UV phase detection, but usually it's in the 200 to 700 nanometers because what happens below 200 nanometers is often um, the energy is too great and it destroys the molecules. And they often have pi bonds. What are pi bonds? Pi bonds are kind of like these double bonds. So over here, we have the molecule quinone. So you see these double lines here and here. Those are uh, pi bonds and those contribute to the ability of a molecule to absorb in the UV visible spectrum. And because of these, the crystals of quinone are kind of a yellowy color. Um, this molecule is present in... Um, things like tonic water and give it its um, kind of bitter taste. Um, other things which can absorb are things like transition metals because they tend to be colored. So if you've ever thought of like, you ever seen rust or something like that, that's um, an iron complex. It's kind of got that orangey, briny, reddy color. Um, that's uh, it absorbing uh, visible light. And that's why it's got that color. So um, the transition metals can be measured by UV vis spectroscopy. So usually they're organic compounds um, with double bonds um, or transition metals um, are the ones which can be detected. The organic species without double bonds, typically their absorbances are too high in energy and they just get destroyed um, or they're not 
uh, sort of like, you know, they, they don't have an absorbance in the UV vis region. So solvent effects, as we saw earlier, have a big effect on the spectrum. Um, they make UV better for quantitative measurements rather than qualitative identification experiments. So, um, you know, like with this aqueous solution, you can't really tell where the peaks are or what's going on. You can kind of tell that there's a maximum in the absorbance over here, but beyond that, you can't really tell much about the molecule. In the vapor phase, you can do more, but still not perfect. Um, so these um, result in the idea that we need to use this as a quantitative measurement tool rather than a qualitative measurement tool. Because if we have aqueous solutions of this molecule, this absorbance band will increase or decrease depending on the concentration of this molecule in the solution. In the vapor phase, I mean, one of the other reasons why this is not so useful in terms of qualitative or identification experiments is that there are a great many molecules which can have quite similar absorbances of um, or energy differences between their grind and excited states. Um, and it's just rather complicated to assign. There are people who have done it, but um, for most conventional uses, it's not very cost or time effective. Solvent, uh, so solvent effects are uh, some, an important consideration because they um, can also absorb UV visible light. So we need to choose a solvent that does not overlap with our sample and so is transparent in that region. So we want to have a solvent which doesn't have an absorbance at or near that of our analyte or species of interest. So polar solvents usually destroy vibrational fine structure. So um, that's why we typically use non-polar solvents if we want to do some sort of qualitative measurement. So for example, you can see the gas phase spectrum of this particular molecule and it in a non-polar solvent like heptane, the peaks are actually still kind of visible in heptane. It's not so bad. I mean, it's not great, but it's, it's definitely not as bad as if it is in a polar solvent like water or alcohol, which just totally destroys any of these peaks and we just get a broad continuum. And that's because these are polar solvents, but these are non-polar solvents. Well, gas is not really a solvent. Um, so non-polar solvents most likely to give gas phase like spectrum and the solvent can change the position of the maximum. So you can see here the alcohol um, solvent, like maybe ethanol, that has a peak at around about 290 or 285, whereas the water peak is around about 275. So you can see that the effect of the solvent can change the peak maximum, which is why they're usually uh, labeled, instead of showing the spectrum for UV vis experiments, we typically just have lambda maxes. So then the measurement window obviously is an effect of the solvents. So there's going to be a certain point to which the solvent uh, is absorbing. That depends on the solvent. So for example, over here on the right-hand side, we have acetonitrile, which has a cutoff of 190 nanometers. We've got things like methanol, 205, dioxane, uh, 215, chloroform, 240. So above below those uh, values, we cannot really reliably measure a UV based spectrum, but above them, we usually can. So solvents can have absorbance ranges. They must be transparent, i.e. have no absorbance in the desired range or measurement window. And some cutoffs are shown opposite. Measurement below this wavelength is not reliable because we're also running into the absorbance of the solvent itself. There are, like, I mean, we can kind of measure the solvent before and kind of subtract it from our sample, but that's not really ideal. Conjugated systems then, so alkanes. Um, so this is uh, a bit of an explanation, a bit of organic chemistry before we get on to the idea of um, these absorbing as these as absorbing species. So um, conjugated systems are going to be collections of double bonds, basically. So alkanes are covalently bonded hydrocarbons. You may have seen them before. They're like carbon-carbon single bonds. Um, and they're sometimes drawn like this uh, in a, a wireframe type drawing. Um, alkenes then are hydrocarbons with at least one double or pi bond. So things like this. So here, this is an alkene where we have a, a double bond um, on our long chain. Uh, here, we've got two double bonds. These are both alkenes. Now, uh, where the thing comes in for conjugated systems is if these double bonds alternate, the system is said to be conjugated and electrons can move along the whole length of the conjugated system. So what are conjugated systems? What do they look like? 
they look like these. So this here is benzene on the left-hand side. So it's got a double bond and then a single bond, then a double bond, a single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. These alternate in a ring. And so this system is said to be conjugated because it goes double bond, single bond, double bond. Uh, the same is true here in this one, three pented, pentadiene or penta di one, three in. Um, so this is a conjugated system between here and here. So there's double bond, single bond, double bond. Uh, this is not part of the conjugated system because there's no double bond over here. Um, these, this is not a conjugated system because there are two single bonds between our double bonds. So to be a conjugated system, i.e. electrons are able to be shared along the length of the conjugated system, it has to go double, single, double. So conjugated systems can be linked by negative charges or lone pairs on heteroatoms. So if we've got a negatively charged part of a molecule, that can contribute to a conjugated system. If we have things like nitrogens with lone pairs, that can also con uh, contribute. Oxygens with lone pairs can also contribute. So here we have oxygens. So whilst we said this molecule earlier was not a conjugated molecule because it goes double, single, single, double, if we put a heteroatom there, such as oxygen, it's got lone pairs of electrons, which actually make this a conjugated system. Um, and then the same thing can be true if we have a negative charge on that position here, that can make this a uh, conjugated system and can link those two. So it can basically take the place of that double bond that we needed. So again, um, Conjugated systems are systems with a lot of double bonds, usually at least two, and they're separated by one single bond. If it's more than a single bond, then they're no longer deemed to be conjugated. Uh, what does a conjugated system do? It allows electrons to flow along the length of it. And this changes the energy um, of the system, and this changes um, how it absorbs light, and it also changes its color. So for example, I leave you with this. Is this molecule conjugated? So effects of conjugation. So you can see here in the diagram, um, if we have an energy between our ground state and our excited state, if we have, as we increase the amount of conjugation, so here we have a just one single double bond, the energy difference is quite large. If we then uh, make a small conjugated system, the smallest possible with two double bonds and a single bond, then we um, see that the energy gap is decreased. Um, and then if we continue to increase the size of our conjugated systems, we'll see that that energy difference continues to uh, decrease. And so the energy difference becomes lower and we see that the absorption shifts to longer wavelengths and the color will change. So for example, over here with ethylene, it's colorless then we'll see that as we go along, we'll change the color to uh, be darker and darker, redder and redder. So conjugation effects. So here we have uh, anthracene, uh, uh, we have actually naphthalene, anthracene, and uh, tetracene. So the peak maxima for each one, the pink, purple one, which is uh, naphthalene, the green one, which is anthracene, and the blue one, which is going to be tetracine, you can see that as we increase the conjugation, so we increase the number of rings here, basically, we have a shift to longer wavelengths. Longer wavelengths means lower energies. So these lower energy shifts are caused by this increase in conjugation, this increase in sharing of electrons. So the increasing redshift of the lambda max with the number of rings is observed. Benzene's uh, lambda max is 204, and that of naphthalene is 286. Um, then for the conformers and conjugation, so um, the shape of these molecules with their conjugated systems also affects their energy. Um, so typically we have um, trans isomers being lower in energy than cis isomers. So uh, that's just due to the overlap of the orbitals involved. So the energies of the orbitals. Remember, we have electrons in an orbital. They're excited to an excited state during the absorption process. So homo electrons have less of a jump to the LUMO, which means it's lower energy and a longer wavelength. So UV absorption by organic species. So most absorption uh, spectroscopy of organic species happens above 100 
and 90 nanometers. Typically, we have broad spectra due to the superposition of electronic and vibrational transitions, and conjugation usually causes a shift of the maxima to longer wavelengths. So for example, here we have benzene, we have naphthalene, we have anthracene, we have tetracene, and we can see that the absorption max shifts as we go through and increase the amount of conjugation. You don't need to remember the names of these things, but you do need to remember like that increasing conjugation size will increase the lambda max value. That's the sort of like the overarching theme here. So typically broad spectra due to the superposition of electronic and vibrational transitions. Remember earlier, we talked about how that energy um, of the transition was made up predominantly of the electronic energy, but there were also contributions from the vibrational and rotational energies. And those contributions brought about this um, change uh, in the shape of the spectrum. You know, it became broader because there were a great many, uh, there were uh, an increase in the different wavelengths that could be absorbed. Um, remember also that um, we can add heteroatoms to a system to make it more conjugated uh, or to link conjugated systems. So saturated organic compounds with oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, or halogen atoms can be excited by radiation from 170 to 250 nanometers due to non-bonded uh, electrons. Um, so those non-bonded electrons are like the lone pair in oxygen, lone pair in sulfur, nitrogen. These are electrons. E minus electrons. Okay, so how do we then do UV vis measurements? So generally, we have a few uh, things to think about whenever we're doing UV vis measurement or quantitative analysis by absorption. So UV vis is an important tool for quantitative analysis and can be widely applied to both organic and inorganic systems. It's sensitive to low concentrations, so we don't need to go particularly concentrated to measure it. Actually, sometimes as we've seen before, high concentrations are far from ideal and can cause um, changes in our absorption spectra, which are not what we want. It has moderate to high selectivity. It has good accuracy. Usually um, the uncertainties are less than 3%. And it's easy and convenient with data acquisition. And of course, it's non-destructive. We get our sample back at the end. So we can use it for other measurements as well, which is really, really quite nice. So again, measurement terms, uh, in case you've uh, forgotten, uh, radiant power um, is given the term P or P0. It's sometimes called radiant intensity or radiation intensity, given letter I. We have absorbance, uh, which is given the letter A sometimes termed optical density, although this is more of a, an archaic term, it's a bit older. Um, you see it a lot in literature of uh, some of these molecules because a lot of the times when you're looking up the literature values, the experiments were done 50, 60 years ago, and the term back then was optical density as opposed to absorbance, but they're the same thing. Transmittance T then is given transmission T, so path length B uh, is also sometimes given the letter L or D, it's always called path length, but sometimes you'll just see the term be different. B and L are probably the most common. D is less common, but L is definitely common and B is definitely common. Absorptivity um, A, sometimes called the extinction coefficient K. Usually it's given in the form of molar absorptivity. So this is the absorptivity per mole of particular species, given the letter epsilon. Sometimes that is also called the molar extinction coefficient, but they're, they're effectively the same thing. So some assumptions of the absorption law that we're going to go and talk about, because remember, these are um, important to consider, because if we don't consider them and take account of them, we may end up with incorrect uh, measurements. So incident radiation is going to be monochromatic. Um, so that means we're only uh, exciting our sample with one wavelength of light. Um, why do we do this? It's because um, we don't want to be measuring the absorbance at a different wavelength than what we want. So like, for example, we measure at individual wavelengths. So we go 401, 402, 403, 404 sequentially and measure the absorbance at each one of those. Now, it happens a lot faster than you might expect, but um, it's, it's, it's a good idea to do this because Otherwise, we might be getting absorbance from other wavelengths that we don't want or by species that we don't want to absorb. And since we're measuring like the, the difference between the incident and the uh, transmitted intensities, uh, it's important that the light be monochromatic, i.e. one wavelength. 
Um, absorbing species act independently of each other, so that's why we need to have a sufficiently low concentration so that the analytes don't interact with each other and change their energies of absorbance. Incident radiation consists of parallel rays perpendicular to the surface of the absorbing medium. So that is just really a, a thing for the setup of our spectrometer. So we have our cuvette like this, then we have our incident light like this, um, like so. Um, then it's going to, this is at 90 degrees to the wall of the cuvette. If I could draw better, it would be at 90 degrees. The path length then transversed over is over the, through the cuvette is uniform. So the cuvette should have parallel walls so that the distance is always the same. So if it's one, if it's one centimeter, it's one centimeter, both at the top, at the middle and at the bottom. Uh, the absorbing medium is homogeneous and does not scatter radiation. So remember that scattering can cause losses of uh, light intensity. And we want all of the losses of light intensity to be due to the absorption of our analyte species. Homogeneous is important because if it's not, like if we have particles suspended in our solution, like we have a colloid or something, then um, it's going to be difficult to measure because the particles might not all be the same size. Um, and also it can increase um, scattering of radiation. Incident flux is not large enough to cause saturation effects. So what this means is that the light that's coming in, that monochromatic incident radiation is not fluctuating in intensity. It should be very, very consistent because otherwise what can happen is that we can um, saturate the spectrometer. Um, it can like, there can be too much light basically getting to the um, detector and lasers can cause these effects. So lasers are, can be high energy and can uh, saturate the spectrometer. So remember that absorption is additive so that the A total, the total absorbance at a wavelength is equal to the sum of all of the individual absorbing species. And so it can be described by uh, the Beer-Lambert law for each species. So for our two absorbing species system, so if we've got a uh, wavelength one, we have uh, epsilon one at wavelength one, because remember epsilon changes at different wavelengths, then um, times the path length times the concentration of species one plus epsilon two at wavelength one times the path length times the concentration of species two. Then at wavelength two, we have a similar equation, only this time the um, wavelength is different. And so the molar absorptivities of compounds X and Y are measured with each, with pure samples of each at different wavelengths. So the two wavelengths are 272 and 327. And these are the molar extinction coefficients for compound X and compound Y. Now we're going to use that to calculate um, the concentration of the species. So a mixture of compounds X and Y in a one centimeter cell, so that means that the path length is one centimeter, had absorbance of 0 0.957 at 272 nanometers and 0 0.559 at 327 nanometers. And we're asked to find the concentrations of X and Y in the mixture. So remember we have our table of data here. So the two wavelengths that we measured, we have the molar extinction coefficients of the two species. We also have our equation here and here. And so we can then substitute one into the other to try and find the concentrations. So if we just sub in the values that we have from our table and from the question, we find that um, for wavelength one, the absorbance was 0 0.957. So we fill that in. And then that's equal to 16,400 times the concentration of X plus a 3,870 times the concentration of Y. These are both times one because the path length is one centimeter. Um, so that's why it's been omitted. Then we do the same thing for wave two. And then we can find out by rearranging. So rearrange this to get it in terms of X, substitute that into this, and you'll get the value for X or for Y, sorry. And then um, do the same for the other, like substitute it in. It's really just a quadratic equation manipulation at that point. So the path length is important. So we're gonna see how changing the path length changes the absorbance. So if a sample for spectrophotomeric analysis is placed in a 10 centimeter cell, the absorbance will be 10 times greater than the absorbance in a one centimeter cell. Will the absorbance of the reagent blank solution be increased by a factor of 10? Let's find out. So if A is equal to epsilon BC, which is our Beer-Lambert law, then increasing B X times will also increase A, a X times. So if this is one and then suddenly becomes 10, all both epsilon and C are multiplied by 10, which would mean that the absorbance would be 10 times greater. So path length can have a considerable effect 
on the absorbance. So that's why, like, if we have a particularly strongly absorbing species, usually we need to um, either reduce the path length or reduce the concentration. How do we correct for dilution then? So the absorbance measured after adding 125 microliters or 0.125 milliliters of ferric nitrile acetate to two milliliters of aptotransferrin, which is a clear solution, was 0.260 for the complex formed. Uh, from the complex form. So um, these two names here might seem confusing um, and a bit scary, but really it, you're just looking at the numbers and um, you want to know the corrected absorbance based on the uh, dilution factor. So the corrected absorbance is going to be the total volume over the initial volume times the observed absorbance. So that's going to be um, 2,125 microliters over 2,000 microliters times the absorbance, which will give us a corrected absorbance of 0.2 two seven six so how do we go about calculating the concentration of a system so using uv vis spectroscopy we can actually uh, calculate the concentration so a compound with molecular mass 292.16 was dissolved in a 5.00 milliliter flask a 1.00 milliliter aliquot of this solution was taken and placed in a 10 milliliter volumetric flask and diluted to the mark. The absorbance at 340 nanometers was then recorded as 0.427 in a 1.000 centimeter path length cuvette. The molar absorptivity at 340 nanometers is said to be 6,130 per mole per centimeter. So how do we then calculate the concentration of this compound? So we need to calculate the concentration of the compound in the cuvette and then make a correction for the dilution factor. So to, in order to calculate the concentration of the compound in the cuvette, we first use the Beer-Lambert law, which is absorbance is equal to epsilon BC, where epsilon is, of course, the molar absorptivity. B is the path length, and C is going to be the concentration of the species. We know the absorption, epsilon and B, and so therefore we need to rearrange the equation to be in terms of the concentration, C. That then just follows is that we then put in the numbers here, and so what we end up with is the concentration of our species being 6.97 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. Now we need to correct for the dilution factor. So we took a one milliliter uh, sample from the original uh, solution, and then we dissolved it in 10 milliliter volumetric flask. So we're asked, what is the concentration of the compound in the five milliliter flask? So the concentration then is going to be multiplied by the dilution factor, which is the volume of the final over the volume of the initial. So that will be 6.97 times 10 to the minus five moles per liter times 10 over one which will give us 6.97 times 10 to the minus four moles per liter as our concentration in the five milliliter flask. And then we're asked how many milligrams of the compound were used to make the five milliliter solution. The answer is the mass is equal to the volume times concentration. So that's the volume is five milliliters times the concentration is this, gives us this many milligrams, not this many moles. Or sorry, this many moles, sorry. Um, so then we use this many moles and this smaller mass to find out the number of grams and then consequently the milligrams. So 0 0.003485 moles times the molar mass gives us 1.017 times 10 to the minus three grams, which is 1.017 milligrams. The measuring procedure then for our uh, UV vis spectroscopy measurements is to measure at the absorption maximum where there is the largest change with concentration and this point adheres best to the Beer's law. So whenever we have a concentration versus or an absorption versus wavelength, you want to find the point where the peak is. So we would measure here in this region here at the top, not here or not here. Because at the top in this region, we have the best adherence to the Beer's law. Um, so we want to make sure that we're controlling the conditions, the pH, the temperature and humidity, et cetera, so that between all of our measurements that these things are consistent so that the only thing that's changing is the concentration. 
Then we need to establish the relationship between absorption and concentration, which we use a calibration curve for, and the bracket, um, bracket unknown concentration. So we want to make sure that we have at least one measurement either side of the unknown concentration. So we want one higher and one lower in concentration. Um, then external standards should um, closely follow unknown sample composition. And if not possible, use the standard addition method, which of course we learned about before, but we'll talk about briefly again. Then of course we measure the unknown sample. So the standard addition method is very useful for um, sa environmental samples or samples with matrix effects or complicated samples, because what it does is it, it uses um, the sample that we already have and we add uh, increments of a standard solution. So it'll be the analyte in some similar solvent. Um, so like, for example, if we're trying to measure iron in uh, wastewater, uh, then we would add small amounts of iron to our, of the same iron complex that we're trying to measure to our uh, wastewater sample, and then measure the UV vis uh, absorption, and then extrapolate out to find the value of the unknown. So here's uh, beer lambert law. So given that Beer's law is that, uh, what is the molar absorptivity of a solution with its absorbent 0.5, path length one centimeter, and concentration one times 10 to the minus three moles per liter? We fill in the values and we find out that absorbance is 0 0.5. Uh, then the epsilon value is going to, or sorry, we're trying to find the epsilon value. So we need to rearrange. That's the only thing we don't know. So then we find that epsilon is 500 liters per mole per centimeter. Okay, so now it's time to look up some atomic spectroscopy. Um, we're going to be overlooking the fundamentals and especially looking at some AAS. AAS is quite analogous to the UV-Vis spectroscopy that we've been doing. So there are four main types of um, atomic spectroscopy. There is atomic absorption spectroscopy, there's atomic emission spectroscopy, there's atomic fluorescence spectroscopy, and there is mass to charge ICPMS. There are also some specialist journals on this. So we'll talk mainly about these three. This one is um, to be aware of, but we will not be going into details on ICPMS. ICPMS is a very is, is a reasonably advanced technique. It's um, very good though, but it's a little bit. Um, it's it's not um, maybe as accessible right now as some of the others. These three pretty accessible. Atomic absorption uses a similar process to UV-Vis where we're looking at the absorption of light by an element. Um, atomic emission spectroscopy, uh, we're looking at the light which comes from a sample that has been um, atomized. And then the fluorescence spectroscopy is one where we're looking at how much light is emitted from a sample that has been excited um, using uh, electromagnetic radiation. So in a, a atomic spectroscopy, what we're generally doing is we're atomizing a sample in some way. We are taking our molecule, our compound, whatever it happens to be, and we're burning it in a flame to create the elemental form. So we have here explained the three main types of atomic spectroscopy, AAS, AFS, and AES. AAS is atomic absorption spectroscopy. So in this one, we're using something called a hollow cathode lamp, which you may recall from our previous sessions on spectroscopy. We'll explain those in more detail, but basically that's a light source which produces light specific for a specific element. And so there's no need for a, a monochromator or a prism or anything like that, or filters, because the light that is produced will only be absorbed by the same element. So we have like a, a lamp that contains iron, that lamp will only, um, will produce light, which is only absorbed by iron. Then AES, so this is where we just burn the, the sample in the flame and then see what light is emitted. So we're just looking at the emission of light from the atom in the flame. We're not trying to excite it in any way, just the excitation is via the flame. Then the laser um, is used in fluorescence spectroscopy. The laser produces light, which is absorbed by the sample, which is, excites it. And then obviously the excited state element um, will then relax back down to the ground state. And when it does that, it will release some of that energy as light. And that light then will be um, measured. 
So uh, these are the processes which are going on. So these are atomic emission transitions. So this is AES. These are atomic absorption transitions. So from the grind state up to the excited states. And then for fluorescence um, transitions, we have absorption followed by non re or followed by emissions, which can also be um, non radiative. So most compounds are atoms in the gas phase. Um, so high temperatures are required 2000 to 6000 Kelvin to just make sure that any compound that goes in there is broken down into its elements. And then they, only the elements will absorb light or or produce light, which will then be measured. So um, it's a destructive technique and you don't get your sample back. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever you're putting in, uh, you don't need any more. Uh, it also uses quite a lot of material, um, at least compared to things like UV vis and so on. But if you really just need to know how much of a specific element is present in a solution, it's really, really quite, quite handy. So this is the general flow of the experiment. It's not so dissimilar from some of the optical instruments that we've seen in the past. The only real difference is that um, in this case, we've got a flame where we're burning the sample as opposed to a cuvette, which is holding the sample. So the hollow cathode lamp is our light source, our source of electromagnetic radiation. We still term the incident light as P0. We still term the transmitted light as P passes through a monochromator to be separated into the individual wavelengths, then to a detector, which transduces the uh, light into a electrical signal. And then obviously that is read out via the amplifier and the computer. So the flame here is kind of acting as the cuvette um, in this sense. Um, here, the flame was used in atomic spectroscopy, which is very much similar to that uh, cuvette in molecular spectroscopy. And we have a path length, of course, in the flame. So the flame is not just like, it's a very controlled flame. It has a known length. And so that enables us to use the Beer-Lambert law because we know very well the path length. Um, we have here then a, a, a mixer where the analyte is mixed with fuel and air um, or fuel and like um, some sort of oxidation source. This can be oxygen, can be um, acetylene gas, um, can be mixtures of these things and they pass through here and they produce just flames of different temperatures. So atomic fluorescence uh, experiments. So in this instance, we're looking at the amount of lead that might be in a tap water um, a sample. So we have here the, um, the setup where we have a capillary tube with a liquid drop on the end and then we have two lasers one which is used for vaporization so it's a high energy laser which will vaporize and our liquid and then on that we will shine a laser a different laser which will produce an excitation and then the excited um, vapor phase liquid will uh, emit light which will then be detected using the detector and then we can get some sort of signal um, and then that can be compared to the parts per billion. Uh, an atomic emission spec uh, spectroscopy experiment. So here um, we're not limited to one element at a time. We can measure multiple elements at the same time um, because we're not like using a hollow cathode lamp with a specific wavelength. We're not using lasers um, to produce uh, fluorescent light. We're literally just taking the background, I suppose, of our sample. And so we can measure multiple different elements. So the what we're looking here is, um, like for example, this uh, emission spectroscopy uh, experiment has different peaks for different elements. There's iron, iron two plus, we've got nickel, we've got another iron peak here, chromium, chromium plus iron. So generally these are very narrow bands. You can see down here, we're talking about 0.1 of a nanometer every time. And so these are incredibly narrow, uh, almost, straight lines uh, and well resolved. And so they can be easily assigned. So the bandwidth here is uh, something I want to sort of emphasize is the bandwidth of atomic spectroscopy is so much less than that of molecular spectroscopy. We saw in the case of like a UV vis experiment where the peaks are very broad, maybe up to hundred nanometers and then atomic spectroscopy, again, kind of um, very, very narrow. So we have very sharp line spectra where there's little overlap between spectral elements. And so we're able to measure them quite easily. We can multiple, uh, measure multiple elements simultaneously. And there are around about 70 elements which are suitable for this kind of experiment. 
So then we have different parts of our system. We have atomization, we have flames, furnaces, and plasmas. The atomizer converts a sample to an atomic vapor, um, which is sort of the, the burning process. Atomization then is done in our AAS and AES using flames and furnaces. And we can also use um, similar techniques like the laser uh, vaporization for our fluorescence spectroscopy. Uh, furnaces are for solid and liquid samples. Flames are only for liquid samples because they're drawn up through the capillary. So if they're solids there, they'll just block the capillary. So the precision and accuracy of atomic spectroscopy is critically dependent on atomization and sample introduction. So here are some of the components of the flame in the atomic spectroscopy. So we have a pre-mix burner um, where the fuel oxidant and sample are all mixed. So the sample comes in here, it's nebulized uh, with some oxidant and some fuel. And then we have a passing through here uh, where it's baffled to try and, and make sure that there are, the flow rate to the flame is consistent. It doesn't sputter. It doesn't like, there are, isn't like an excess or a um, sort of a, a lack of, uh, the mixture reaching the flame so it tries to be consistent and then so uh, the glass bead then sort of like uh, will um, any sort of larger droplets will condense on the glass bead so nebulization so this is the formation of small droplets an aerosol is formed which is a fine suspension of liquids or solids particles in the gas and then the nebulizer creates an aerosol from the liquid sample so the aerosol reaching the flame contains only about five percent of initial sample here are some of the flame types. We have acetylene uh, flame, we have um, air. Uh, okay, so we have mixtures of fuel and oxidants. So acetylene is a fuel, a very, very common fuel, and it can be mixed with air, usually compressed air. Um, and then depending on what mix and what components of acetylene can be mixed with nitrous oxide, oxygen creates different temperatures. The most common ones are probably acetylene air mixtures um, where they have a temperature range of 2,400 to 2,700. It's because of like the, the lack of need to keep um, sort of explosive uh, oxygen nearby and it's just relatively cheap. Um, but then if we need a very high temperature, we mix acetylene with oxygen instead. And this is for refractory elements, those that have very high boiling points. Furnaces are an alternative to the flame um, where it's a similar kind of process. You're heating it up and um, your sample is atomizing because of that. So we're electrically heating this time. So there's a circuit involved which produces a resistance which heats up this furnace and then the sample gets um, atomized. So we have an electrically heated graphite furnace. It offers greater sensitivity than flames and requires less sample, one to 100 microliters for furnaces, whereas we need one to two milliliters for flames. So you basically just put a wee, wee drop in here and then that uh, is atomized and that will then um, be measured as it atomizes in, it sort of like fills the space and then the light comes through and uh, interacts with the elements. So there are some uh, things to take note of whenever you're placing your sample in a furnace because we want the sample to be um, in one place close to the heating source so that there isn't like um, any problems with heating the sample. So we see here at the top a good placement where the pipette has been put near the bottom of the furnace and it's been the droplet has been dispensed onto the bottom of the furnace in a very uniform manner. There isn't splattering around the top. If we, for example, just put the pipette in and then like dispense the droplet like this in the middle, what would likely happen is that we would splatter um, droplets all over the uh, furnace and that would be poor precision we'd have bad placement and we wouldn't get the results that maybe we would want so here the solid sample is weighed onto the graphite platform and then it's just placed in there if it's a solid sample so you just put it in a little pile and it works very well so we talked about the bandwidth being very narrow and that's important because a lot of the bands overlap and so in order for in, or in order for them to be useful they need to be narrow but there are certain things which um kind of uh, cause broadenings in that. So um, there are three main sources of broadening. There's the uncertainty effect, where we have a broadening of around 10 to uh, the minus four nanometers. And considering these are like, you're talking about 0 0.001 nanometer wide um, peaks, these are pretty, pretty significant broadenings. 
um, then Doppler broadening, which is almost on the order of the, the peaks themselves, and then pressure effects, which are caused by collisional broadening. So the uncertainty broadening is uh, caused in changes in the natural line width. So uh, that's based on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the shorter the lifetime of the excited state, the more uncertainty it the more uncertain its energy is going to be. And so it can be described by this equation where the change in the energy between the ground state and the excited states times the change in time. So the time, the lifetime of the excited state before it decays to the ground state um, is going to be greater or approximately equal to H over four pi where H is the Planck's constant and pi is of course pi. And so this can be used to calculate the broadening for that. Uh, Doppler broadening is um, in line with the Doppler effect. So atoms in a hot flame have atomic motions in every direction, which causes Doppler broadening and Doppler line width broadening can be calculated as so. So the change in the wavelength is equal to the wavelength, the central wavelength times seven times 10 to the minus seven, which is just a constant um, times the square root of T over M where T is the temperature and M is the atomic mass. And so as the atomic mass gets larger, the Doppler effect uh, decreases. So um, here are two examples of Doppler broadening. So uh, rapidly moving atom in flames, if the motion is towards the photon detector away from the photon source, then we have um, the radiation wavelength uh, will decrease. So the emitted or absorbed um, high frequency. And if the motion is receding from the photon detector, i.e. towards the photon source, so it's moving towards the photon source here. Um, so these are actually up the wrong way around. But uh, so this one is this one, and this one is this one. So if the motion is receding from the photon detector, i.e. it's moving towards the photon source, the detector is over here, the source is over here, it says light source, um, then the radiation uh, wavelength is going to increase, and we're going to be moving towards low frequencies um, compared to the higher frequencies that we'll get here whenever the uh, motion is towards the photon detector. So this is different from like, for example, the liquid in the cuvette or something in UV-vis spectroscopy, where its movement is not quite as uh, important on the line width changes. It does, there is, there is a contribution, but because the contribution is so small, it's not really considered. So furthermore, on Doppler broadening here is an example of how we might do that calculation. So atomic motions in every direction cause the Doppler broadening. So for emission from iron, uh, where the atomic mass is 56, uh, near 300 nanometers uh, from iron at 250 degrees Kelvin, what is going to be the Doppler line width broadening? So uh, the change in the wind, change in the wavelength is going to be approximately equal to the wavelength, this 300, times 7 times 10 to the minus 7 times this term here, which takes into account the temperature and the mass. So that put the numbers in here and we find that the broadening due to Doppler effect is 0.0014 nanometers, which is an order of magnitude larger than the natural line width. So this has a huge effect on the, um, on the change in line width of the emission. So then pressure broadening as well. So this is the easiest one, I guess, to understand. So this is really just to do with the atoms hitting each other. And whenever they hit each other, they uh, emit light of different wavelengths or they, they lose energy. And then whenever they do decay, the change in energy is less. So collisions of the absorbing or emitting atoms with other atoms or ions in the heating medium cause pressure broadening. This shortens the lifetime of the excited state and causes change in the energy level of the ground or excited state and leads to line broadening. So high pressure leads to higher collisional frequency, gives greater line broadening. So uh, AAS, which is the, the major technique that you'll probably come across, quantifies the absorption of ground state atoms in the gaseous state. And the reason why you'll come across it more is because um, there, the vast majority of atoms are in the ground state and we're dealing with high temperatures here. So the effect, the population changes are not going to be as significant. So most of the atoms are still going to be in the gaseous state. So these atoms absorb UV or visible light and are excited to higher electronic energy levels. Very sim This is the same process which happens in UV vis. The only difference is that we're dealing with atoms here. And the concentration of the analyte or atom is determined by the amount of absorption. So it's very similar. We build a calibration curve and do the same process. The concentration is determined using a calibration curve after instrument calibration with standard solutions or by the standard addition method. 
and AAS is commonly used for the detection of metals and metalloids in environmental samples. So here are some of the detectable elements for atomic spectroscopy, uh, AAS. So the ones in uh, cyan are not going to be measurable, but the ones in magenta are. So the vast majority of transition metals and generally metals in, and metalloids um, are measurable. But the non-metals such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, hydrogen, and so on are not, but there are other techniques to measure those. So it's not like they cannot be measured at all. Okay, so let's look at the components in an atomic uh, spectrometer. They're very similar to the optical components. The major differences are the light source and the um, cuvette, the sample holder. So we have, of course, five principal components. We have a light source, which is usually a hollow cathode lamp in AAS. We have the atom cell, which is an atomizer. We have a monochromator, which separates out the light. We have a detector and we have a readout device. So we will only really talk about the first two here. Um, the monochromator is interesting in the sense that we can just separate the line, the, the different wavelengths of light. And so that whenever we are measuring them, we're only measuring one uh, wavelength. So that's the important thing to remember with monochromators. So the light source then, so hollow cathode lamp is made of an analyte amp element. So we um, make the lamp that we have and use is going to be specific to the element that we want to measure. It has a tungsten anode inside and there's a hollow cylindrical cathode made of the analyte element. So there's a cylindrical cathode here. It looks like a U shape, kind of like a musical fork, but really this is a tube. It's just like we've cut a, a cross section through it. And so the shape of this means that a beam of light is created or electromagnetic radiation is created, which is parallel, uh, parallelized and so can be focused on the sample. And remember that we have a specific lamp for each specific element. So an iron lamp for iron, copper lamp for copper and so on. So the atomizer then, so the AAS measures atomic um, concentrations. So the atomization of particles is needed to obtain atoms for analysis. And it is done by exposing the analyte to high temperatures in flame or graphite furnace. And so after atomization, the analyte element is able to absorb light from the lamp. Uh, so the atomizer is the furnace. And so then finally, we have the components again, um, the amplifier and the detector is just the transducer where we take the light and we convert it into an electrical signal. And then the readout machine can be a, a computer, it can be just a manual, uh, it can be like a little a dial or something as well. And so that brings us to the end of this. Thank you for watching.